proceed now. Good morning. Welcome to Ripley Presbyterian Church, this day of worship. I uh, do have a couple of announcements. I know some of you were expecting Elizabeth Elliott to play the piano. That's why some of you came. There's been a change. I'm going to play the piccolo instead. No, I'm just kidding. She's already in the position. So we are excited to have Elizabeth uh, being our pinch hitter today. Thank you for sharing your musical gifts. I know y'all will enjoy them who are joining us virtually too. We want to give thanks to the Presbyterian women. You are phenomenal. Presbyterian men are okay as well, but the women did a phenomenal job offering love and care and food to the Horton family this week. Um, goodness gracious, and it was wonderful, all of y'all, that uh, Diane, Sherry, everybody, I know it, that Pat, the names, the list goes on. You get in trouble, you start naming names. Uh, but you all, Shirley, just everybody jumped in there and prepared wonderful food and offered your love for it. I bet you there's more like 75 people rather than 50, but we didn't run out and we kept on going. So thank you all for being the church. Uh, other announcements this morning. Our mission emphasis for this month has been terrific. You've given graciously of your funds. Our, for those of you unfamiliar, our mission emphasis, here's what we do at Ripley Presbyterian Church. Above and beyond our offerings, we have a specific mission focus each month that's unbudgeted where we all can join together in our generosity to serve ministries within our community and the world around us. This month, it was Tippa County Good Samaritan Center, or in May, we surpassed that by far. I think our goal was $500. Don't remember it. It may say here we were closer. It was in our weekly newsletter, closer to 700, I think. So thank you for being the church for our combined offerings of love for those in need, embracing them with Christ as he calls us to. Are there other announcements we need to share? Well, a very important one. I just thought of one more that I have. Next Sunday, now make a mental note, and we'll make an effort to send out a reminder next week. Jennifer, remind me if I forget to remind everybody that next Sunday's worship will be virtual. So you can once again enjoy your pajamas, your coffee in front of your laptop, and worship wherever you'd like. We want you to worship with us, but be at your own setting. We will not be worshiping in the sanctuary. Yours truly will be out of town. And traveling, so I'm going to offer a uh, devotion sermon, uh, short worship service, as we did during COVID when all of our worship was virtual, next Sunday. So tune in, if you can, live on Facebook at 1030. If not, we will have that recorded. It will be sent out. It will be on our YouTube page as well. So that we'll have that virtual worship next Sunday at 1030. Okay, are there other announcements this morning? If not, let's do share in our prayer list, our joys and concerns with our church family today. Uh, we, want, we do have a couple of additions and updates. Uh, David Horton, excuse me, David Quinn did have his heart surgery this past week. Seven stents uh, were... Uh, I guess you'd say implanted, installed. Anyway, he is doing very well, so we give thanks for your prayers and love for he and my Aunt Janet during the recovery process. Uh, the little child we've been praying for, Brenna Brad Radslaff, is doing wonderful. She had the heart condition, and uh, they have had some procedures done for her, so thank you all for being the church, loving that family. Also, uh, Ginger Britt and I have been corresponding this week about her grandson, Will. Many of you know her son, Charlie, and Jenny. They have uh, their son, Will, who has some significant health challenges. He was in the ER he, uh, this past week, but he is home. He did come home, but Ginger asked that we be prayerful for them. Ginger recently moved her membership back to Ripley Presbyterian Church, so she lives in the Hernando area. 
but let's uh, embrace Ginger's entire family, certainly little Will and uh, Mama Jenny and Daddy Charlie. Are there other additions to our prayer list this morning? Certainly want to continue to be prayerful for Stan, his family, and uh, we want to add the family of Willa Moore. That's Addie Moore's grandmother. Addie's a member of our church. Um, and uh, Lisa Moore's mother. Frankie Cross, okay. We want to remember the family of Frankie Cross from Faulkner. Are there others this morning? I'm watching to see if we have any posts online. Hello, Eddie and Judy. Lynn, good to see y'all. Any other prayer concerns or joys? We do celebrate those uh, who are recovering. We ask you to continue to remember every person on our prayer list. We'll be praying for them during the prayers of the people today. All right. If there are no other announcements to share before we begin our worship, let us now worship our God in joy and in glad.
would you receive with me this call to worship from Psalm 138 as soon as I pray you answer me you encourage me by giving me strength though I am surrounded by troubles you will protect me from the anger of my enemies you reach out your hand and the power of your right hand saves me. Would you join me as we pray in unison our prayer of confession? Almighty and merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is nothing good in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O oh God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared unto men in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grant that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of his name. Amen. Let us now have a few moments of silent confession. Hear this declaration of forgiveness. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. This proves God's love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. Friends, Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. This morning's first reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, beginning in the 8th verse. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together once more. Oh God, we bow in your presence, seeking your illumination as our Worship begins with light coming into this sanctuary. 
It's a symbolic reminder and statement to us that we need sight from you. That you inspire and provide goodness and grace into our worship, into our lives that promotes our worship. So we come into your holy setting, this house of salvation, to proclaim your goodness in our worship as we celebrate in beautiful music and song and prayers and praise. We also come seeking, O oh God, to be molded and made more in your image that we may know the joy of our salvation and life in your love. So will you now, Holy Spirit, open our ears and hearts and eyes to receive and see and embrace your words of life, that in doing so, we are constantly reminded that you indeed are our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. The second lesson of Scripture today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll begin with verse 13, continue down through the first verse of chapter 5. Listen with me for the word of the Lord. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believe and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake. So that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Anytime I hear that Genesis text that Jennifer shared with us this morning, I'm reminded of the little story, the little joke, I guess you would say, of the pastor who began a new ministry in the community. And he went out to visit one of his parishioners. He knocked, and there was no answer at the door. So he left his card and just wrote on the card a biblical text from the book of Revelation. Well, of course, the parishioner didn't know the text off the top of his head, so he looked it up and he read in the Holy Scripture where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone would open to me, I would come into them and dwell with them and them dwell with me. Well, the next Sunday... The church member went to church and in the offering collection portion of worship, he wrote his own card and note and he wrote a passage of scripture that we heard read here this morning from the book of Genesis. The pastor too, Freddie, had to look it up. He didn't have the whole Bible memorized. He looked it up and the response from the church member was this, I heard you calling in the garden, but I was naked and afraid. We give thanks for the promises of Scripture, for the life-giving love of laughter and joy and dwelling in the house of God. What a gift worship is to our journey of life and family. And we need worship. 
Most of all in times of brokenness, sadness, tribulation, and trials. It is this gift of being reminded, giving consideration of God's love for us that sustains us when life's journeys are the most challenging, right? For those of you who are watching virtually, you may not be aware, as many of us are, that we knew an extreme tragedy in our worship community this past week. One of our members, Stan Horton, died tragically in a swimming accident at the age of 49 on Memorial Day, leaving behind his senior daughter in high school, his young son, Stan, I think Stan's going into the ninth grade. If I shortchange you, Stan, forgive me for that. But there were many questions, tears, as there will be in the days of head. But there was something holy in celebrating his life together as a worship community in this sanctuary. You see, we refuse to call those type services mere funerals. And even more than a celebration of life, it was a time to worship and consider God's goodness and faithfulness, even in the midst of tragedy. Even as we search for answers, and we all at times have those questions if we're genuine and real about our faith of why. Why would a holy God, why would a God who's in complete control. Why would a God who is the embodiment of love allow such horrific events to happen to us and those we love? Surely, we've all pondered those questions in our tragedy, in our hardships, the trials and tribulation of this broken world. Why God? As we consider those times that promote questions for us in life, I think it's more than coincidence that our text today is this beautiful reading of Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. This text was picked out a couple of months ago, and it seemed quite appropriate that the Spirit prepared it for us on this day. This promise where Paul says in verse 16, he says, We do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction, he says in verse 17, is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Now there's a lot going on in what Paul is saying there. But you know, I wonder, can we embrace these words of Paul's with fresh ears where he says to us to consider that the, the brokenness of this world, this, as he describes this momentary affliction that we all go through at some times beyond our own perils, those of those, those, those that we love when they face them. Paul said, if we consider that this momentary affliction, the brokenness of this world, is preparing us for an eternal glory that is without end, an eternal joy, an eternal love, that will never fail us. Let me say it this way. I've quoted before C.S. Lewis, who once tried to make sense of the brokenness and challenges of life. I want to read that quote again today. And Lewis says this, If you think of this world as a place simply intended for our happiness, you will find it quite intolerable. But if you think of it as a place for training and correction... It's not so bad. Lewis is saying the words that Paul proclaimed to the church in Corinth, 
The only way, friends, we can make sense of tragedy and why a loving God could allow devastation in a broken world is that if this world is truly not our home. This world is a preparation for our home in glory. So the brokenness that we face will not last. You know, I think of the journey my dad and I made a few years ago in Kenny and some of us, we went on a hiking trip up to Mount Whitney, the highest point in the continental USA, uh, 13,500 feet, something like that. It took us well over 12 hours. We started out uh, three or four o'clock in the morning, didn't get back, I guess it's more like 18 hours, till late in the evening. We had eaten just old carbohydrate bars and drank a lot of Gatorade and juice like that. And uh, when I got off of that mountain, we got the best pizza I've ever had. I mean, it was delicious. And I've tried to find a pizza that can compete with that ever since then, and I've not been able to find it. And you know what I've come to the conclusion of? I'm not so sure if that pizza was that wonderful or if I was that hungry. I just don't know which one it was. It made it that much better because I was so eager to have some real food. Haven't we all had experiences like that? Now, in a more profound way, a much more transformational way, does that relate in some way what Paul is saying to us? By going through life's journey, in a far greater way than a hiking trip to the highest point in the nation. Could it be that by going in this journey of life, when we taste the true food, the true fruit, food of fullness and joy that awaits us in heaven, how much more beautiful will our reign be as children of God because we've gone through the brokenness and imperfection of this world. Friends, I, I really believe that. That the imperfection that we face is so that we may know the fullness of our joy even more abundantly in glory. It's the only way I can make sense of why a loving God would allow us to face tragedy if this truly is not our home. You see, that's what Paul also said. In our text today, those familiar words to many of us, right? Where Paul says, if this earthly tent that we dwell in is destroyed, we have a building made by God eternal in the heavens. Now, traditionally, I've heard that text and I've thought of it thinking it simply of my body. If my earthly body, this tent that I live in, is destroyed. I have a home in heaven, but even more than our physical body, let's, let's think and let's remember this analogy, and I think it's there for a reason that Paul gave to us, this comparison of a tent and a home. Now, some of you listening and worshiping today may be outdoorsy type people. You like to rough it. Somebody like Benton Elliott, he could go sleep in a tent, probably doesn't even need a tent, could just sleep on the ground and go hunting and have the time of his life. Where Monia Hill says her view of roughing it is a Holiday Inn instead of a Hampton, Freddie. Don't give her that opportunity. Don't sign her up. I think of my friend in Benton's and co-worker and my cousin David Horton telling about a trip he went on once when he stayed in a tent with our friend Steve Wallace. Steve broke out an ancient tent, and David said they popped that tent up, set it up, and he said as soon as he laid down on the ground, he had a rock sticking right in the center of his back. And he moved over and tried to get a little comfort, and he did. His back wasn't hurting anymore, and then it started poking him in the head. And he said just when he finally didn't get comfortable, but it got at least in a position where he maybe could get a little rest. Something started biting him. The tent had fleas in it. David said, I abandoned the tent. I tried to go outside. I don't think I slept a bit all night. 
He was truly roughing. Now, some of y'all may have had more positive experiences with tent living. I think of my neighbors the other day, the little girls that live right beside us, lovely uh, girls that they had their tent popped the other night. Mama was out there with them, and I said, y'all camping out tonight? And you know her answer like any parent. We're going to for a little while. Sure enough, I was up the next morning at 6 o'clock, and I walked over or looked over. There were no one to be found. They had made their venture back inside. You see, tent living is not the best, is it? Tent living is a fragile example of the comfort that we have in a true house or even a home, right? There's not much comfort when we're in the tent. Those rocks that poke in our back and our head are symbolic of the imperfection of this life. Maybe that's what Paul is saying in our text today. When he says that uh, uh, that eternal home is not simply made with a tent, but it is a house and a home that is filled with comfort and warmth and love forever. Friends, have hope. As Christian people, Hold on to the promises that Paul proclaimed to the church in Corinth today where he said, do not lose heart. In the midst of trial and tribulation, know that we are being prepared for an eternal glory of love that is without end and that throughout this journey, God will sustain us through the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen us even as we strengthen one another throughout life's adversities until love, joy, laughter, and life are complete in glory. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we bow in your presence this day, grateful that you do journey with us through trials and tribulations and even tragedies. And the comfort that we have in knowing is that you will never leave us, as your scripture says, nor forsake us. We pray, O oh God, for your church for the ministry of this congregation. But beyond the four walls of this sanctuary or even our worship community, we pray wherever your gospel is practiced and proclaimed by your people in faith, will you inspire, will you empower your world through your glory from your church. We pray for our nation. We lift up our leaders. We pray for our president the Senate, our Congress, the Supreme Court. We lift up those who protect our freedom and serve our nation through their military. We pray for our state, county, and city governing bodies, for any who hold authority and power over others, the employers and the rich and strong among us. We ask you to guard their hearts in the spirit of Micah to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly in your way. We pray for the weak, for the sick, certainly the grieving, and the dying this day. We ask for healing and wholeness, and restoration. We pray for every person on our prayer list, God. We say them by name as they're written on paper and on our heart. And we ask when it can be in accordance with your will, O oh God, that you would pour forth miracles of grace into their lives and healing and wholeness. We pray for those that are closest to us, our friends and family, those you've entrusted us to minister to most of all. We pray for those from whom we're even estranged, those furthest from us, perhaps even our enemies. Would you bring healing to our relationship? God, now we pray for each other. 
For every person listening, we pray for comfort and restoration as we pray for each other and with one another, whether the needs be physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, relational, professional, you are the physician, oh God. Would you answer our prayers for one another and with one another? We pray, God, I do now for those who may be seeking peace in the life to come, who have questions and concerns and have never claimed you as Lord, would you, oh God, make yourself known to them right now that they may know in turning to you there is love and joy forever. And now, God, as we embrace your love, we join our voices as one and say the words in prayer you taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, at this time we share in what we call the affirmation of faith. And to do that in our tradition, we recite together the Apostles' Creed. This is a time for us as believers to affirm together what we believe about our God. But you know what else this is? This is a time for that person who's never began their journey with Christ. I believe this can be their opportunity to profess their faith too in the saying and the affirming of life in Christ. So let us, as current fellow sojourners of the faith and those who are just beginning this journey, say together what it is that we believe about our God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, I feel restored and renewed for being in the house of the Lord today. I pray you feel that as well. May you go forth now as his light and love to serve the world around you to the glory of the Lord. And as you go, receive with me God's blessing for us as his people. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance, his gaze upon you, and give you peace now and forever.
You do? Y'all still here? Got to go home now. Have a great week. Bless you. <laughs>